Ancient sites do harness energy. We're going to see a variety of sites that do this. The first one we're going to talk about is menhirs or standing stones. And I'm, I want you to just primarily look at them. There's not a whole lot to say except how beautiful they are. A person is only about this tall, so this gives you a sense of how huge some of these are. These stones are able to harness energy coming up out of the earth and ripple it out into the surrounding countryside in expanding circles. And that energy, as we're going to see, actually has positive benefits for people's health, has positive benefits for vitality. There's many, many things that these stones will do for you. And they harness an energy of consciousness, an energy that will actually help us to become more evolved, more intelligent, and more psychic. And it's just a phenomenal feat that they would actually be able to take these giant stones and get them to stand up like this in the first place with the equipment that was supposedly available to them at the time. This is quite a stunning accomplishment. Dolmens are the next thing we're going to look at. And dolmens are actual cellars where you have stones built into a room. The purpose of these, and they are all over the place, they're in France, they're in Scotland, they're in Ireland, they're in England, is that you go inside and you meditate. And what it does is it captures energy from the earth and it concentrates it and focalizes it inside under this area here. And so you're sitting in there meditating and you get this big energy blast. And so look at that. Now how in the world, I mean the, the, the weight of this stone is so tremendous and it has stayed there for all these thousands of years. It never fell over regardless of earthquakes or whatever happened. It's still there. And you can see another dolmen right over here. I mean, that's a side view of it. And here it is from the front. It's, it's astonishing that they don't fall over, but yet they don't. Some of them are a lot more organized, where they actually have breathing holes, and then it's all kind of built in on itself. So this is a big cosmic energy chamber. You really get a big blast going in underneath one of these and meditating. The next one we're going to talk about is barrows. Barrows are mounds, and they exist in America as well as in England. The ones that I'm showing you now are all going to be in England. It doesn't look like much except just a big uh, round dome. But the interesting part is, and you can see how pyramidal that one is, the interesting thing is that many of them have entrances. And you can actually go through the entrance and go inside. And there's a big round room inside. And you meditate inside the room. And once again, you get this big spiritual energy blast when you go in there. Now, they're not only single mounds. Sometimes they become elongated mounds. And this is all related to tailoring the energy coming out of the earth. Henges are the ones that everybody is so familiar with and we love so dearly because of Stonehenge. But that's not the only one. This is a part of Avebury here, which is another henge. The sheep really like the energy the stones give off. <laughs> Sometimes you get large stones that are just set up right but are not specifically tall and narrow like that. This is an example of a barrow and a henge. You have a henge in the front and this is a barrow in the back with an entrance up here. Another example of a henge, another example. So you can see these don't just occur a couple times. They keep happening over and over again. And these are only the ones that are still standing. There's many others that have been buried. Now this is fascinating because this is the full outline of Avebury. Every single little dot in this entire serpent shape that you see here used to be a standing stone. And every single one of them still exists. They've dug them up from the ground. So this was an enormous serpent with a head and then the stomach that has eaten something. And this is Silbury Hill. So what you actually have here, if you notice the triangular relationship between these areas, is all these stones and the mound are all built to focus energy here and here primarily. It sends the energy into this area where a large gathering of people happen, and it acts as a consciousness enhancing technology, which we now have lost access to in the West. And this, of course, is Stonehenge, the most famous group of these standing stones of all. Quite beautiful, tongue and groove lintels that stand on top of the menhirs. This is what it looked like when it was first built. And you can see that every single one of those stones was there. And they've just fallen apart over time. And then over time, these post holes were dug that allowed them to calculate eclipses and planetary cycles and all sorts of things. Now the next question is, are these ancient structures connected? And the science that will help us to understand this is ley lines. 
Sir Alfred Watkins was the modern pioneer to discover how ancient sites all come together on uniform blueprints. In 1920s, he found that ancient holy sites could line up in straight lines. He called them lays. The sites from extremely different ages, millennia apart, were all aligned together, including Neolithic, Bronze Age, Iron Age, and the Christian era. So here he is with his camera, and he would actually take pictures of long distances and calculate how straight the lines were, and they were amazingly accurate. Now look at this. What you see in this diagram is a, is a part of England, and every single one of these little, where you see a word, that's an ancient sacred site. And it could be anything from cathedrals to Stonehenge to all sorts of stuff built in all these different eras of time, but somehow every single one of them lands directly on that line. Now why do you think they would do that? Doesn't it seem to suggest that they knew something? That there was some energy coming out of the earth that means that if you build a pyramid or one of these standing stones, that it's going to be a lot more powerful if you build it on that line than somewhere else. It's basically like this. If you want to eat food for dinner, you're not going to eat air, right? You're going to actually have a real meal. This is where the food is <laughs> for the pyramid. So if you, want to, if you want your object to work, if you want your structure to work, you build it where the energy is. So it can harness the energy that you built it to make for you. The BBC published a very interesting article that gives us insights into the science of ley lines. The area again is Gloucestershire, and here's the line that we just saw before, and then you can also see there's another line there, which also has many, many ancient sites on it. Uh, ley lines are one of the most enduring earth mysteries, a network of prehistoric pathways crisscrossing the country believed to have mystical significance. Their alignments and patterns of powerful earth energy, said to connect various sacred sites including churches, temples, stone circles, megaliths, holy wells, burial sites, and other locations of spiritual or magical importance. Major prehistoric structures of higher importance can frequently be found to occupy locations where two or more lays intersect with each other. Alleged ley lines are often identified by spiritualists dowsing with rods. These methods are questionable in their accuracy, so the alleged placement of ley lines should be treated with some skepticism. Well, thankfully, that might have been true if all you had was dowsing, but what we actually have is a worldwide map of all the ley lines and why they're there, because it's all based on geometry. We're going to get to that right now. Hyperdimensional grid effects. The first place that we go to understand how all these ley lines connect together around the world is we got to find where all the weirdest stuff happens on the planet. Ivan Sanderson did that by investigating a massive number of disappearances of ships, which is marine, and aircraft. These ships are marine vessels that are sailing through the ocean, and all of a sudden they're gone. And there could be somebody sailing behind them and they seem to vanish. They don't know where they went. There's no flotsam, there's no wreckage, there's nothing to show that these ships were there. They just disappear. Now sometimes wreckage has been found and the phenomenon has been attempted to be debunked by people finding certain examples of wreckage, but that does not mean that all of this stuff is disproven by any stretch. Sanderson discovered that all of these different disappearances of aircraft and boats all occur at 12 locations around the world. They can all cluster around those 12 locations. And even more interestingly, the 12 locations are equally distant from each other. I mean, if you're just zoning out and kind of getting hypnotized by me and not really paying attention, you're, you're not going to get the importance of that. <laughs> not that I'm hypnotic at all. But equally distant from each other, what does that mean? That's like a guitar string. When you pluck a guitar string, all of the points in which the string is vibrating like this, in between two points, it doesn't really move, and that's called a node. The nodes are always equally distant. That's a product of vibration. So if you have a string vibrating and it creates five nodes, those nodes stay the same, and the string is going up and down around the node like this. So what we're seeing is that the Earth's energy has these 12 spots where it's pulsating in and out like this, but on those 12 spots, it's not moving. 
And what you're seeing is a gateway between dimensions that forms at those spots, which are geometric in nature. If you connect the dots, it forms a geometry called an icosahedron, which is one of the basic so-called platonic solids because it was invented by Plato, who also gives us the dubious distinction of inventing school. So if you want to blame somebody for why you had to go through all those years of school, you can blame Plato. One of the 12 spots is the Bermuda Triangle, as you see here. Here they are laid out along the Earth. You can see this is uh, the Devil's Triangle here in Japan. This is Easter Island down here. You have another one off Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. You have another one down here around Africa. That's the groovy stuff that's happened with the Himalayas. All the stories of the masters of the Far East, the masters and teachings of the Far East, Baird Spaulding. He's got all that stuff about ascended masters. You have weird stuff that's happening with sightings in Africa, dinosaur sightings here. This is another dis disappearance spot. Most of the rest of them, as you can see, are in the ocean. The only two that are on land are in Africa and here in the Himalayas. You had a question? Isn't that, where the, that one in the Pacific Ocean, that where the great garbage patch is sitting on? Yes. Actually, that's true. The great garbage patch is right over here because this is an area in which all the ocean currents circulate called the doldrums because you don't want to sail through that. There's no wind there. But the reason why the garbage patch is formed there is because the, the water always circulates around these vortexes. These vortexes have a lot of energy around them. There's also the most number of electrical fish in the ocean in these areas, which is another interesting thing, like electric eels. Now, if you actually look at the whole Earth together, you get the icosahedron. That's the shape. That's how they all connect together. So this is a geometry. Now, the reason why this is important is that this geometry will form naturally if you vibrate liquid with a pure sound frequency. That's the big secret. A pure sound frequency, like one of the white keys on the piano, you play that frequency into the water, whatever the water is. In this case, it's the energy that behaves like water, but it's the same principle. But you can do it with regular water, and you get that geometry showing up in the water when you play these sound frequencies. So that's the basis of it. It's basically just geometry. It's a vibration. Geometry is vibration as a crystal. So these three Russian scientists, and everybody laughs when I say their names for whatever reason, Goncharov, Morozov, and Makarov. <laughs> I don't know why that's funny, but OK. If you all want to laugh, you can laugh. Found that over 4,000 sites fit on the global grid. And the global grid that they found, they started with Ivan Sanderson's basic 12 points the icosahedron, and then they simply added in another geometry called a dodecahedron. And by mixing the two together, they found all the ley lines. They found a way in which everything that has ever been built that looks like it's built to harness this energy, including Chinese temples, pagodas, Stonehenge, dolmens, menhirs, all the stuff I was showing you, cathedrals, all around the world, Stone, Easter Island, the mound builders in America, you name it, that all, he, they found 4,000 of these kinds of sites and every single one of them was on this grid. So the whole world knew how to use this technology back then and it's been lost. This is the most advanced version of the grid that we now have called becker hagens and this is where the black spots of the original 12 nodes of Ivan Sanderson's grid and then you see how it's evolved with, you now have two icosahedras together one that is out of phase with the other, and that's what creates these 120 different triangles that form the grid. It's called the Unified Vector Geometry 120 Polyhedron, or UVG120. That's the long name for it, but the simple name is becker hagens grid, which is a lot easier to say. Question. Yeah. Are there any here in the United States? Oh, yeah. If you look at the United States on the becker hagens grid, what's the first big node that you see? It's right around Los Angeles in Baja, California there. So this is why there's so many people in Los Angeles, why it's such a huge population center, because we like to be near these nodes. They feel good, and they create a lot of energy. I'm very energized by living in LA. We're in this area right now. We're on this node right now where this talk is happening. The other big one, of course, is right off Florida. And look at this. The lines, again, are very important, and that line shoots straight up the east coast of the United States. So everybody on the East Coast, the whole East Coast megalopolis is all feeding off of that line. And then when people get old and they get sick, what do they do? They want to move to Florida. Why do they want to move to Florida? Because they feel healthier. Why do they get healthier? Because they're on the node. And the node feeds your DNA.
there's Hawaii, okay? And what we know is that Hawaii is right on one of the nodes, and the cancer rates in Hawaii are dramatically lower than anywhere else in the world. Dramatically lower. We also find out that in Washington, D.C., the cancer rates are much lower. So the people that decided where to put the capital of the United States made darn sure that they used this grid. Because what you have is a lot of these politicians and they leave, like I think Richard Hoagland talks about Sam Donaldson as one example, that he left Washington, D.C. and died very soon afterwards. Because in D.C. they have a grid node that gives you a lot of energy that helps you heal. Now what you can also see here is grid effects in which the land mass is being sculpted by these geometric forces. These lines are not arbitrary. You can see these island chains that fit perfectly in a grand circle. If you connect these nodes on the grid together, you see how they all fit together. Now the Germans discovered that there were some houses where the energy was really bad and people were getting sick and dying. 1920s in Germany with the dowsers discovered that more people got cancer in these certain houses and they revealed from their dowsing, which I believe is credible, that the houses had veins of water running underneath them. The neighboring houses did not have two rivers that crossed together under the house. So it's when these two rivers of water crossed together that you were getting these negative effects that actually diminished your health. And apparently the reason why is that when you have two rivers crossing over each other underground, that they draw energy, that it creates an energetic friction that scrambles the field and actually scrambles your field and creates cancer. So it's not always healthy. Sometimes it can be unhealthy. So can we prove the site's harnessed usable energy? Well, obviously somebody thought so, because every single daggone site that you can find out of 4,000 in the world, all were built on this grid. If the grid doesn't mean anything, then why did they do that? Obviously there's a reason. The grid can be shown to have shaped the continents for where they are now, and clearly there was a usable energy that they were harnessing in order to bother to build the pyramid in the first place. I mean, it's not exactly an easy thing to build these pyramids. These stones are weighing hundreds of tons. Some of them are bigger than 18 wheelers. They're much bigger than 18 wheelers. They're the size of small buildings, a single stone. We can't even lift them now. We don't have any crane in the world that's big enough to lift these stones. Why did they bother to do it? And if they're doing it, why would they do it on this specific spot on a grid? What's the point? The point is that they're using energy. Well, if they're using energy, then how can we prove that? I'm not just going to ask you to take my word for it. I want scientific proof that shows me what they're doing and how we can use that technology today to help the world. Is that not a good idea? Let's have, I mean, that's a great idea. Because if we can use this technology today, then we might be able to solve some problems that we have on the Earth, including the energy crisis. And we may be able to find new ways to keep people healthy. Because, as you can see, the Krebs houses in Germany would actually make people very unhealthy, and other sites were very much associated with health. That's why they built the dolmens and the menhers and the barrows. These were meditation spots. So in Russia, they now have done research with pyramids that holds the key to explaining all this stuff in a way that we can make sense out of. What you're seeing here on the bottom is people. And this is a 144 foot tall pyramid built out of fiberglass and PVC pipe. PVC pipe on the inside, as you can see here. And then these are the sheets of fiberglass on an angle going up the inside. An amazing, amazing structure that has many, many interesting things that happen once you've built it, both inside and outside. This is not simply something that you get to look at and say, wow, it's a pyramid, it's cool. This is a, a working technology that they have studied scientifically. And by the way, this is not woo-woo science. These are the same people that were in the military industrial complex of the Soviet Union who after the fall of the Iron Curtain in 1990-91 time frame, still had the facilities, still had the communist government paying them a monthly salary, but didn't have anything to do because the military-industrial complex no longer existed as it once did. 
So they still have the labs, they still have a salary, and they can study whatever the heck they want. So because they had this whole background of research, they built pyramids. And they studied the science of pyramids, and they came up with some amazing research. So here are some smaller examples. You can see they were built in the countryside. This one obviously is a lot shorter. Now let's take a look at some of the things that they found. If you build one of these pyramids over an oil well, you get 25% more productivity out of the oil well. It's amazing. And you get 25% fewer contaminants in the oil. They found incredible healing results. First of all, if you take a poisonous substance and you store it inside the pyramid, the chemical makeup of the substance changes and it's no longer toxic to the body. The pyramid is harnessing the very energy of life, the energy that keeps things alive and keeps things healthy. They even found that cancer, you could give the same carcinogens to lab rats and then to rats in the pyramid, and the rats in the pyramid would get much, much fewer tumors, if any, than the rats in the lab. You give them exactly the same carcinogen, and the rats in the pyramid do fine. The same thing was true with typhoid fever diabetes, all this kinds of stuff. In the pyramid, there was no problem. There was a 400% increase in the productivity of seeds that were stored in the pyramid. That's another amazing effect. All you got to do is take seeds and scatter them into the pyramid, and then leave them there for a while, and then start planting them. And the plants are 400% bigger than the same seeds that were not put in the pyramid, over and over again. So it's like that whole, the seed itself and the plant that grows from it has been supercharged by this energy in a very fascinating way. There was strong electrical activity generated at the top of the pyramid, meaning that you could actually put a battery pile, like a battery charger up there, which is just positive, negative, positive, negative in a big solution, and it starts generating electrical current, and you can power your house with it. Now this is where it gets really interesting because what they also found was that earthquakes did not happen anymore as these big, nasty, catastrophic events. They only got small little quakes that didn't cause any trouble to the land. Now, if the ancients are building pyramids all over the world and we know that Atlantis sank, then do you think that maybe they were trying to make sure that that didn't happen again? Or, an even more interesting idea, is what if the ancients knew that Atlantis was going to sink and they were in a mad dash to try to stop it from happening by building pyramids around the world and they didn't get the network finished in time? That's another possibility. We don't really know which one it is. There was also an enormous column of energy detectable around the pyramid in the atmosphere, hundreds of miles wide. And this column of energy would actually deflect severe weather you would have a storm coming in, and there's this big circle that forms around the pyramid, this energetic circle. And the storm just goes right around the circle. It's incredible. So what does this start telling us about the nature of weather? Think about that for a minute. What is weather? What is a severe weather activity? It's a torsion field, right? It's a consciousness thing. Earthquakes. Earthquakes, to some degree, are related to this torsion field because if you have this pyramid which is regularizing that flow of energy, then you no longer get earthquakes anymore. The ancient teachings tell us that the Earth is alive and that bad weather and bad problems are the result of the Earth being upset with us, that we create a disharmony. And the disharmony that we create is what creates the bad weather and the bad earthquakes and the volcanoes and all that stuff. And the pyramids were able to make all this stuff happen. The Russians took granite that looked like salt and pepper. It was white and black granite. And they put the granite inside the pyramid. And then after a while, they took the granite out and they built jail cells with it. And what they found was that the prisoners who stayed in the jail cells made out of this specific granite were much more well-behaved than the other prisoners. The prisons that were built, where the cells were built with this granite, those prisoners in those prisons were, they all got off of alcohol and drugs, they all started to get along with each other much more than, than the others. 
And the problem is that the translation was bad and we thought that it was actually salt and pepper that they were feeding the prisoners. But it turns out that salt and pepper is actually granite. So that's, that's a mistake. So this proves that there is a connection between the consciousness of humanity and the consciousness of the Earth. Earth changes are not something that's happening randomly. We're also, oh my god, global warming, what are we going to do? Oh, we got to use solar power and stop driving cars and stuff. Well, obviously we should figure out how to get cars running on water, and I was talking to you about that technology. That already exists. We could desalinate the oceans very easily with some of these technologies. But global warming is an energetic phenomenon. And it's a phenomenon that, as I said, is occurring throughout the solar system. It proves there's a connection between earthquakes and consciousness. It proves that there's a connection between severe weather and consciousness. And it proves that our consciousness is directly affecting the Earth. So that's a very significant piece of information for us to have because it gives us the power back. We're no longer out there expecting that these things cannot be dealt with, that there's really nothing we can do. We do have the control. We do have the power. And it comes from pursuing the truth within ourselves. And then that truth has a radiant quality that affects the whole planet. So all we have to do is work on ourselves, work on our own inner spiritual quest, find the love within ourselves, find the ability to love ourselves, which is primarily through forgiveness. If you have forgiveness, then you can deal with all of these terrible things in your life that you haven't been willing to accept. With forgiveness comes the stoppage of the wheel of karma. You don't have to keep going through cycle after cycle of suffering anymore. Because now what you're doing is breaking the cycle. And so on a collective level, all these earth changes over here are happening because we haven't gotten to this forgiveness over here. And when we master this, then these synthesize together and we won't have earth changes anymore. That's part of what 2012 is about. The Law of One series, My Spiritual Backbone, says very clearly, there are no more earth changes after 2012. All of the scary stuff that's happening stops. So regardless of what you believe is going to happen, if you buy into the Law of One and if you follow my work, you know how strongly I do. Because there's a lot of science that backs up what was in those books. The books were channeled in 1981. And there's a lot of stuff that came out since then that validates point for point what's in those books. And it's way too long to explain right now. But there's a lot of stuff on my website, divinecosmos.com, about that. It said very clearly, 2012 is an energetic transformation. It's a transformation that affects everyone on Earth. It's a transformation that effectively turns us into light beings. And that the Earth changes as we know them stop after 2012. Very fascinating. The pyramid was the master design in which the open sarcophagus in the king's chamber, you're supposed to lie in it. You have an out-of-body experience where you then face your own shadow self projected to you as this monster that you have to wrestle with in the astral plane. And if you successfully can forgive and accept that part of yourself that appears to be evil, then you get the healing. Now this is what's happening to us as a planet. What do you think that projection of the part of ourselves that looks evil is in the planet right now? The New World Order, the Illuminati, the government. If you are angry at the New World Order, if you are angry at the Illuminati, if you hate them, and if you're out there afraid of them, they're winning. Because negative entities feed on your fear. They actually harness your energy of fear. The fear that you feel sends energy to them. What I'm here to tell you is that there is nothing to be afraid of because they are fulfilling their purpose of acting as the projection of our shadow. We're going through this planetary initiation of the open sarcophagus. The reason why it's open is that once we're through this, there is no more death. We have reached a state of immortality much different than where we are now. That's what the prophecies say. When someone who is uh, profane, if you will, using a Masonic term, goes into the pyramid, like Napoleon, he had a terrible night. He tried to stay in the sarcophagus overnight. He had horrible nightmares, and he ran screaming out of the pyramid. <laughs> so you have to be ready for this. That's his actual sketch of his terrible night in the pyramid that he drew. Isaac Newton, of course, was just another guy, a scientist. 
and he happened to see an apple fall, and everybody saw apples falling out of trees all the time. The only difference is that Newton starts saying, hey, why did the apple fall out of the tree? Is there something that made the apple fall out of the tree? It's gravity. There's a force that pulled the apple out of the tree and made it hit the ground. It doesn't just happen. There's a reason for why it happens. So this is the new Newtonian revolution. And the question is, are we looking to see the apple falling? Are we looking at the obvious truth of pyramids, Stonehenge, standing stones, temples, churches, megalithic structures built all around the world, 4,000 of them, and every single one is built on this grid. That's the same thing as Newton seeing the apple fall. That's the same thing. The only difference is that we haven't yet identified that there's a force responsible for why they built these things in these places. This brings us back to the questions of God. What you're starting to see is a provable spiritual teaching, a scientifically valid exploration of a supreme being. That's where we're going. Religion doesn't need to be there except as a way to organize your understanding of a one infinite creator. You can go into this atheistic and look at it strictly scientifically and come to the conclusion that there must be some intelligence to the universe. And that's one of the problems is that the word intelligent design has now been irrevocably intertwined with creationist biblical teaching. And that should not happen because many people who are proponents of intelligent design are not buying into mainstream Christian theology. But what's happened is that either you're a scientist, which means you don't believe any of this stuff, or you're a religious nutcase. But there's a middle ground. And that's the thing is the ancients knew this. And then you have groups like the Masonic Order which have taken all these ancient traditions, like on the back of the dollar bill, and they make it secret, but they hide it right out in front of you. They've shown you the pyramid, right? They're showing you the eye going down. Obviously, they think that's really important because it's one. They have the word one on the dollar everywhere, one God, right? It's the one God. Uh, George Washington's eye is directly in the middle of the dollar on the front. If you go and take a look, you'll see that because there's the... There's a little uh, painting in the top of the U.S. Capitol dome. If you sit on your back and you look up at the top of the Capitol, there's a painting up there, a fresco, called The Apotheosis of George Washington, in which he is positioned on a rainbow because they believe that he ascended after he was president of the United States and that he became a god because they believe themselves to be gods where not, no one else is. And so what happens is they do not want us to know this because if we knew that the pyramid could bring us to a godlike state, then we would start building them and we'd start using them. And they don't want us to have the technology. So they flaunt it right in front of you. They put it on the dollar bill. And they build the largest building in Washington, D.C. is what? The Washington Monument, which is what? It's a big obelisk. It's the same thing as the Menher, the Standing Stone, intended to ripple out energy into the surrounding city. You have a question? Oh, um, she asked, is, there, is it true that the world elite have different DNA? This is very interesting. And somebody asked me about uh, our new whistleblower, Dr. Pete Peterson, and, and wanting me to share some of his testimony. And I said this on the radio with Project Camelot. I'll repeat it. There are some technologies that have been discovered that allow you to have a certain degree of influence over people's minds. Mind control. Okay? It's scary stuff. It is primarily something that can create blunt changes. It's not anything that can beam into your head and make you do very specific things. That's a misnomer. But it is possible to make a rough change to the way that people feel using certain types of energy based on these technologies. However, Dr. Peterson's research people found that fully 15% of all the people in the world cannot be affected by mind control. Ever. Ever. Now we got this from the highest level of the black ops community. 
They cannot be affected at all, ever. They developed a technology to make sure that if you're not part of that 15%, that you become part of that 15% who can never be affected by mind control. The technology is very simple. And they gave it to all the world leaders and all the Illuminati politicians. And they would hide it under their shirt lapel. See, I don't have one because I'm not in there, all right? I'm just proving it right now. The technology is this little device that you put in your eye and it has a little blinking light in it. And you turn a knob on the, on the thing and it makes the light blink faster and faster and faster and you look at it. And what you're supposed to do is you keep looking at this device until the blinking frequency is so fast that you don't see the blink anymore. That you only see a, a clean light. Now what you want to do is get to the point that you can see it blinking faster and faster. That's the goal. You want to be able to see the blink and not have it turn into a solid light. Now, it's called a flicker frequency generator because what happens is it finds out the exact level. You, you, tur you turn it up just to the level where it becomes a solid color, where you no longer see blinking. And then there's a little weird circuit in there that's based on torsion fields. It's this funny little circuit and it generates that frequency and it's beaming it into your body. It's a very, very simple circuit. There's nothing high technology about this, but what it does is it keeps your brain rate, it keeps your frequency of your brainwave activity up at the level where this frequency is flickering at a higher speed, okay? Once your brainwave activity is up at that higher speed, you cannot be mind controlled at all. Now, any of us can reach that frequency. And the best way to reach it is guess what? You knew what the answer was, meditation. If you are in a positive, uplifting state of consciousness, if you are inspired and you're not negative and down and, and but you have this positive outlook, your flicker frequency is too high to be affected by mind control. Now then the next question is, well, 15% of the people automatically don't have any susceptibility to mind control and it turns out that yes they do have a slightly different form of DNA than the rest of the planet that's true but it's not just people in the new world order and it's not just a master race it's not just the white man it's black people it's Asian people it's every race has part of this 15 percent the thing that these guys in the government haven't discovered yet is that that little DNA marker that they found in the DNA is something that you switch on. You're not born with it. You switch it on by getting enlightened. Okay, that's why 15% of the people have it. It's the DNA marker that shows you that you have reached a level where your DNA has activated and where you no longer are susceptible to mind control. So. If you are worried about this kind of stuff, if you are in fear, the answer to fear is love. Because fear is the absence of the energy of the universe. The energy of the universe will destroy poison, it will destroy disease, it will bring you bliss, it will bring you happiness, and it will bring you vitality to your physical body. It will raise your IQ, it will raise your vibration. It does these amazing, miraculous things. And the reason why you can see it in the DNA is that you switch on your DNA. We're going to look for a moment at crop circles and I'm gonna show you some patterns in the crops that actually predict this type of change happening in the world, that there's a DNA change going on. First of all, I wanna make it clear that crop circles have existed for a long, long time. If you go back to 815 AD in France, back then there was no church and state separation. The church was the government. Well, that's got to suck. <laughs> <laughs> now, in this posh quarters that he's got here with all the luxurious interior decorating and lighting, he's busy scribbling away at an edict to try to further control and manipulate the masses. And the edict is called Against the Foolish Opinion of the Masses About Hail and Thunder. This is basically the 815 AD version of swamp gas because they believed in cloud ships 
Ships in the sky like boats, but they're in the clouds. From what they called Magonia, that were flattening crops into circles as a ransom to protect against bad weather. So what they felt was that these cloud ships were giving them good weather, that these cloud ships were making sure the weather was good. But hey, if you want me to give you good weather, you need to give me something. Let me flatten these crops down into beautiful little circles for you. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but they were pagans and they were running around naked in the forest, so <laughs> we gotta kinda give them some credit where credit is due. So he had to issue a prohibition against locals taking seeds out of the crop circles because they wanted to use them in fertility rituals. Why do you think they did? Because these crop circles were totally energized. And when you built something out of them and you ran through it, man, you got a big, big charge of energy. It's amazing. So that's why he spent so much time having to defend the farmers because the farmers were getting so angry about everybody taking out the crops from their crop circles that they actually had to complain to the government and make a government edict that says you can't do it. In the 12th century, you see reports of fairy rings, which they call the ring of daisies caused by elves dancing. I found this 1880 illustration actually showing the fairies running around in a circle, stamping down the grass. Very fascinating because this is the crop circle. That's how they believed it was being made. And in 1678, you have this legend of the mowing devil in which a farmer hired a mower to mow down his crops. And the mower says, I want $2,000 to mow down this crop, even though it's only gonna take me, you know, a day. And the farmer's like, $2,000, you know your mind. I mean, I'm just making it into conventional terms just to try to make it more accessible to us. I'd rather have the devil mow my crops down than you. And he goes to bed that night, and the whole field lights up like it's on fire. Oh boy, something's going on out there. Am I going to lose all my crops? Is it burning? Then he goes outside the next day after all this fire, or what he thought was fire, this brilliant white light, and a perfect circle had appeared in the crop so neatly mowed that no mortal man could have done it. So this obviously scared the crap out of him. And so, of course, being in the 1600s, it's the devil. It's got to be the devil got to be. And so they actually illustrated the devil going around with his little sickle and chopping the crops down. <laughs> In the same period of the 1600s, Dr. Robert Plott was also looking into crop circles among many other forms of research. He was one of the first paleontologists who was digging up dinosaur fossils and trying to make sense out of what this was. And so when he dug up a particular fossil, he thought that he was seeing the scrotum of a giant. So he is our first homoerotic paleontologist. <laughs> and yes, that would be an enormous boner. <laughs> this is actually the hip bone of a megalosaurus, so you can imagine how well hung this giant was. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> and what he was doing is he was drawing the crop circles that were showing up in the English countryside. And they're not just circles, look at this. Now this is his really, really silly hypothesis where he says, oh, well, there is a square gust of wind which drew, drew this perfect square in the ground, of course. That's how it works. What you're seeing is that the modern theory has really not gotten a whole lot better than this. <laughs> we haven't really grown much in 400 years in mainstream science because some of the English say that the crop circles are nothing more than an army of hedgehogs running round and round. Literally, I mean, that's one of the arguments of what, what was causing this to happen. He also found that the soil became much more dry and loose than ordinary and that it had a white whore on it. I'm not even going there, so don't even. <laughs> much like moldy bread with a musty, rancid smell, but to the taste insipid, meaning it didn't taste bad. Now, that's a heck of a scientist, man. Ugh. <laughs> you can imagine. That's, that's brave. That's, he's a real trooper. Here's what's fascinating. Dr. Gil Levengood documented exactly the same thing in the 1990s. Because you have a technology that is zapping the water out of the soil, which makes the soil get super dehydrated, which is why it gets so dry and crumbly, right? All the moisture has gone because the technology is pulling the water out of the soil to make sure that the crops don't do what? Catch on fire. 
That's why some of the other research that's been done has shown that there are natural underground water aquifers where the crop circles are being formed. And when a crop circle comes down, all the water under the ground goes away. Why? Because the water is being pulled out with an advanced technology to stop the crop from burning up. That's what's going on. Now, in the late 1940s, William Cyril Williams actually saw a whirlwind touch the ground and form a circle. In only a couple seconds, the wheat fell down and produced a sharp-edged circle three to four meters in diameter. That's in the late 1940s. So here we have a guy who's seeing what he thinks of as a whirlwind, meaning that he's seeing objects spinning around. And this perfect circle shows up in the ground. That's the 1940s. 1972, in Warminster, suddenly I heard a noise. It seemed that something pushed down the wheat. Check out the next sentence and really pay attention to that. What does it say? That night the air was completely still. No wind. This is not a wind phenomenon. And here is an eyewitness. We send people to prison for life. We have executed people on eyewitness testimony. And here you have an eyewitness standing in a field and watching a crop circle being formed right in front of his eyes, unfolding like a lady's fan, forced down in a clockwise direction with a high-pitched hum. And there was no wind. He just literally watched the crops just go whoosh, and boom, there's a crop circle just right in front of him. You can imagine how amazing that must have been to see. Just amazing. So in the early days of the 1970s, you had single circles. The next stage was that you got four points around the circles. That became very common for a while. Then you started to see a lot of this kind of stuff. And for a while, people didn't know what that was. But then we looked back in the ancient iconography and we found that it was a symbol of the pregnant mother goddess. What do you think they're telling us by giving it to us in the earth, in, in crops from the earth? Could it be that the earth itself is pregnant, that the mother earth is giving birth to a new age, that that's what this 2012 thing is about again? The same people that built the pyramids and gave us the year 2012 in the pyramid and gave it to us in the Mayan calendar. If you believe that the Mayan calendar was built not by the Mayans, but by the people who were helping the Mayans? Could it be that they would now be coming back for the last 1,200 years since 815 AD, making crop circles, and then telling us, look at 2012? But did they tell us, look at 2012? And the answer is yes. We're going to get to that in a second. Now check this out. In case you didn't think that it was the goddess, they came back a couple years ago and said, nope, it's the goddess. There she is. <laughs> Here you see three pregnant goddesses, one, two, three. And actually, that could be one over there, too. This came through in 1990. It was on the cover of the Led Zeppelin box set, which I got for Christmas in 1990. I had no idea that that was real. I thought it was just something they'd made out of a carpet or something. I had no idea it was actually crops. 1991, you've seen me talk a great deal about this in my other articles, the Barbary Castle Formation, which appears to be saying first dimension, second dimension, third dimension fourth dimension, that this is a dimensional shift. Because first you have just the point in the void, then you have the rotation in two dimensions where it starts to fan out, and then it becomes three-dimensional. If you connect these lines together, you have what looks like a pyramid. And then you go into the tetrahedron inside the sphere, and that's the fourth dimension right there. Next you have the Mandelbrot set. A group of scientists were sitting around studying crop circles and said, wouldn't it be amazing if we saw a Mandelbrot set show up in the crops? And the next day, that's what happened. <laughs> They're listening. <laughs> 1996, around Stonehenge, right in front of Stonehenge, truck driver is going by, and he drives past this area of the countryside that's flipped up like this, and he doesn't see anything. And 15 minutes later, the farmer found this formation in his crops. Now, each of the distance between these tram lines is about 90 feet. So this is an enormous, enormous size object that was formed in 15 minutes in the crops on the ground. Surveyors were called in, and it was asked of them how long would it take to build this with any type of normal process. And they said three days minimum, 15 minutes. And then again, you go back to 815 AD, and what did the pagans in France say was causing crop circles to form? Cloud ships from Magonia. Do you think maybe they saw the cloud ships? 
No, why would they actually name them cloud ships if they hadn't seen them? Of course they saw cloud ships. So that's what I'm trying to tell you here. It's like, look, these guys have been coming here for 1,200 years in ships, and they're building crop circles for us. So what's the message? What's the point? Well, check this one out. I mean, this is, look at how big that sucker is. 90 feet between each of these lines. That's enormous. And it's just beautiful. That's, that's my favorite one of all, because there's so much geometry inside, like the cat's cradle, as you can see here. It's, it's amazing. Now this was an uh, obvious illustration of the Koch snowflake, which is one of the fractals. And then scientists started saying, you know, the skeptics started saying, oh no, that's not a Koch snowflake. It can't be. So circle maker said, okay, fine, you don't believe us, you don't believe it's a Koch snowflake, we'll build you another one, we'll put a snowflake in it for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll show you. Now we know what we're talking about here. So, now that is obviously, obviously an army of hedgehogs running round and round <laughs> caused that to form. This last formation is my favorite one of all because to suggest that anybody could have hoaxed that mandala with anything they could do on the ground, it just, it's, it's crazy to think that that could have been done by people with any type of land equipment. I mean, it's, these are crops. We're talking about stalks of wheat. And how in the world do you get it that precise? There isn't one mistake. If you look at it and you really study the flow pattern, there's no mistakes in that sucker. It is perfect. How the heck could that have been done? How the heck could it have been done in 815 AD? Because it's ETs, because it's not from us, obviously. Now, are these circles just showing us pretty colors and pretty patterns, or are they actually giving us a message? The answer is yes. The message is genetic change, evolution. Look at this, 1991, you see chromosomes, but more importantly, you see chromosomes breaking. That's what happens right before the cell divides. The cell division is what creates new life. Here, in 1996, you see a very clear DNA spiral in the crop formation. Then in 1999, you see the same type of curve in this formation, and it's a single sine wave, and then you come back less than a month later, and now it's fanned out into these groups of three. What you see here is the DNA spiral at the top, clearly shown with the 12 circles and the two lines going through it. Then you have a triangular shape in which you get sine waves. But then in the third shape, which is only a month later, you're seeing three strands not just the sine wave, but now there's three limbs to each of these geometries, suggesting that there's something changing in the DNA itself related to this geometric vibration, this harmonic geometry. This is another very obvious description of a DNA molecule because what you're seeing is the twisting double helix. And again, remember, these have been showing up since the, eight, the eight, 815 AD, eight, 800s in the AD era. So this is not new, and it's clearly telling us, look at our DNA. Now, this actually may be perhaps the most significant crop circle ever, believe it or not, because you're getting all these complex metaphors in one shape. In the center, you have what appears to be the Milky Way galaxy. This would be the center of the Milky Way. This is the arms of the Milky Way. But then, doesn't this two sine wave pattern look familiar? Didn't you just see that right here? Okay. But look at this. Now you got DNA coming out of what? The center of the galaxy. And even more importantly, this part in the middle is being highlighted, and that's a yod, which is a Hebrew symbol that indicates spiritual energy, he knows, coming to manifestation. We have a man named Omer who's here from Tel Aviv in Israel. Let's give it a hand for Omer. And he starts nodding his head because he says, oh yeah, that's the Yod. It's a classic Hebrew symbol and they put it right in there. So it shows spiritual energy manifesting. Now here comes the definitive 2012 formation that actually flags the era right around that time. What you're seeing here is quite literally a planetary alignment of exactly how the planets look in 2012. The exact day being December 21st, 2012. Now, pay special attention to the diameter of what is indicated to be the sun here. That's very important. 
Now initially you look at the inner planets, and what you see is that Venus, Mercury, Earth, they're all aligned with, for some reason they messed up and looked at December 23rd, but the planets don't move fast enough for this to make too much difference. It is the 21st, okay? Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, and then when you go out, you see Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. Pluto's the only one that's off by a little bit, and my contention is that that's because, first of all, Pluto is not actually a planet, and second of all, if they'd put it any closer to this line, it would have broken the line and it wouldn't have looked right. So we're told, basically, you don't need to worry about this because Pluto moves so slowly, there's no other time that could be indicated by this alignment except December 21st, 2012. Now, the farmer gets all pissed off and decides that he's going to drive lines through the crop circle to try to ruin the circle. And the circle maker says, oh, you don't like it? Cool, well, I'll come back and I'll draw twice as much. <laughs> <laughs> But check out what else he did. Not only did he draw all these little glyphs over here that look like descriptions of various ETs and ET races, but look at the width of the sun now. The sun is now going all the way out to Venus. And so this is very much indicating some sort of massive change that's gonna happen in 2012 on December 21st that's gonna do what? Something to the whole way that the sun works the solar system. It's a solar system change. The December 21st, 2012 planetary alignment was messed up by the farmer, the circle makers came back, and when they came back, they, they tagged it like graffiti. Yeah, baby, that's my fit right there. All right? Where'd that? That must be Curtis. I don't know how he got in here. And then, they, not only did Curtis tag it for us, but then we got the sun that suddenly widened. And as many people have noticed, there's an S shape. Do you see the S in there? So we have some very interesting stuff going on here. And it says that the solar system is going to transform. Well, that's pretty cool. How did we get all that in one crop circle? That's amazing. <laughs>